Good evening, Phillies and Gentle Colts, and welcome to my darkest closet. I am Corpulent Brony, and tonight I'm presenting a story of suspense and mystery in a series called, oddly enough, Corpulent Brony Presents. I think everyone enjoys a nice murder, provided he is not the victim. Tonight's little comedy of bad manners is concerned with the dream of all of us who harbor homicidal tendencies. The perfect murder, of course. To be serious for a moment, there is no such thing as a, as a nice murder or a perfect murder. It is always a sordid, despicable affair. Especially if you don't have a good lawyer. <laughs> Nervous. Very very dreadfully nervous I'd been and, and am, but why will you say that I am mad? The disease has sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in Tartarus. How, then, am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but, but once conceived it haunted me day and night. Object there was none, passion there was none. I, I, I love the mare. She had never wronged me. She had never given me insult. For her tricks I had no desire. I think it was her hat. Yes, it was this. She had the hat of a wizard, a blue star-spangled hat. Whenever it fell upon my eyes, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the mare, and thus rid myself of the hat forever. Now, now this is the point. You, you fancy me mad. Mad ponies know nothing, but you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the mare than during the whole week before I killed her. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of her door and opened it. Oh, so gently. And then, when I'd made an opening sufficient for my head, I'd put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed so that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the mare's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see her as she lay upon her bed. Ha! <laughs> Would a mad pony have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern, cautiously. Oh, so cautiously. Cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single, thin ray fell upon the wizard's hat. And this I did for seven long nights. Every night, just at midnight, but, but I found the hat never on her head. And so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the mare who vexed me, but her evil hat. And every morning when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber, and spoke courageously to her, calling her by name in a hearty tone, and inquiring how she has passed the night. So you see, she would have been a very profound mare, indeed, to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon her while she slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hoof moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there I was, opening the door, little by little, and she not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps she heard me, for she moved on the bed suddenly as, as if startled. 
Now you may think that I drew back, but no. Her room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness, for the shutters were close fastened through fear of robbers. And so I knew that she could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on steadily. Steadily. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern, when my hoof slipped upon the tin fastening, and the mare sprang up in bed crying out, Who's there? I kept still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle. And in the meantime, I did not hear her lie down. She was just sitting up in bed, listening. Just as I have done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the hall. Presently, I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief. Oh, no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the mare felt and, and pitied her, although I chuckled at heart. I knew that she had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise, when she had turned in the bed. Her fears had been ever since growing upon her. She had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. She had been saying to herself, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a rat crossing the floor. It is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes, she had been trying to comfort herself with these suppositions, but she had found all in vain. All in vain. Because death, in approaching her, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused her to feel, although she neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing her lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a single dim ray, like the thread of the spider, shot out the crevice and fell full upon the wizard's hat. It was on, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness. All a star-spangled blue that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the mare's face or body, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely upon the damned spot. And have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over-acuteness of the senses? Now, I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the mare's heart. It increased my fury, as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the hat. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The mare's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous, so I am. And now, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old trailer, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer, I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart must burst. And now, a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The mayor's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. She shrieked once. Once only. In an instant, I dragged her to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over her. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The mare was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. 
Yes, yeah, she was stone. Stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. She was stone dead. Her hat would trouble me no more. If still you think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the forelegs and the hind legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the trailer and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no pony eye, not even Celestia's, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught all. Ha <laughs> ha! When I had made an end to these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three stallions, who introduced themselves, with perfect suavity, as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for what had I to fear? I bade the gentle colts welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The mare I mentioned was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the trailer. I bade them search. Search well. I led them at length to her chamber. I showed them her treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But, ere long, I, I felt myself getting pale and, and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a, a ringing in my ears. But still they sat, and they chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but, but it continued and gained definiteness until, at length, I found that the noise was, was not within my ears. No doubt I now grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice. Yet the sound increased and, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles in high key and with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the stallions, but the noise steadily increased. Oh, Celestia, what could I do? I foamed. I raved. I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards, but the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder. 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 And still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty Celestia, no. No. They heard. They suspected. They knew they were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought and this I think, but anything was better than this agony. Anything was more intolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now, again, hark! Louder! 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 Villains! I shrieked. Dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks here. Here. It is the beating of her hideous heart. There's nothing more I wish to add. So good night. 
Until next time.